to turn our Bibles to the book of Numbers, the fourth book in our Bibles. Uh, The first five books are called the Pentateuch, the first five books, uh, or sometimes called the books of Moses or just the law. So Numbers chapter 4. You should also have a sermon notes page. It uh, has uh, uh, a little bit of an outline at the beginning, some example outlines of the whole book, and then uh, some of the points we're going to look at. We're not going to see all this this morning, but uh, this is just for you as you read through. It's kind of selective to see some, uh, something of what the book is about. Uh, now, I don't know if you know this. I don't know if, uh, I, don't know, I honestly don't know if I've ever told anybody this uh, in this room. What major did I start off as in college? <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows that. No one knows that. No, not philosophy. There's a hint. There's a hint. Here's a hint. I wasn't, uh, I'm not a numbers person. No pun intended, yeah. I was an accounting major, uh, of all things. Can you imagine me as an accountant? I can't even imagine that. Uh, I can't even balance a checkbook. So, uh, but I was an accounting major back in the day. It was a long, long time ago. Uh, here we are this morning. Uh, in the providential guidance of God over many decades. Uh, and uh, so here I am and here we are. And we turn our Bibles to this book of Numbers. This book full of uh, numbers, these uh, two censuses uh, of all the the males 20 years above, uh, 20 years old and above, uh, all the numbers of the Israelites and so forth. It's a book of many, many numbers. And uh, the title of the book of Numbers, though, uh, at least the the Hebrew, the Jewish title is, is the fifth word in the Hebrew text is Bamidbar, which means in the wilderness, in the wilderness. And so that's the Jewish title of the book is in the wilderness. Uh, later on, the Hebrew Bible is translated into Greek. That's called the Septuagint translation because there were 70, at least traditionally speaking, there were 70 translators. They put it from Hebrew into Greek because the, the Mediterranean world was, uh, was a Greek-speaking world by that time after Alexander the Great uh, had ruled uh, and his, uh, uh, those who followed after him. And they gave it the Greek title of arithmoi. Arithmoi, and you can see how that comes into English as uh, arithmetic, right? Mathematics or numbers. So it's the book of numbers. Why? Because chapter 1, as you see there, right in front of you, if you have your Bible open, and then if you go to chapter 26, there are two censuses of the Israelites, full of numbers, full of numbers of all the males who were 20 years old and above, who were eligible to fight in Israel's battle. So we turn to this book of numbers, or the book of In the Wilderness, And we see here this beautiful picture uh, this morning of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. I should have mentioned, if you're you're new, this is our fourth sermon for the whole Bible. So we're going to summarize for you, hopefully this morning, the book of Numbers to encourage you to go read the book. Some of you maybe have read it ahead of time, before today. Some of you, I hope, will go out and read it afterwards. Uh, On the outline I give you, there are three three somewhat helpful outlines. It's it's not the easiest book to outline. As you're reading through it, you're kind of trying to figure out where things fit and where the, the sections begin and end and so forth, but you can see there are three little outlines. I hope they're somewhat helpful. There's a chronological outline that you can follow, uh, and you see that there, chapter 1 to the middle of 10, and then 10 to 21 and so forth. Uh, there's a more geographical outline of the book. It's similar to that uh, chronological one, uh, and you can see the Israelites there in the wilderness of Sinai. Uh, later on, they're in a region called Kadesh, and then eventually they move from Kadesh to Moab, and they're just on the precipice of the promised land. Uh, the next book is Deuteronomy, Lord willing, next Sunday. Uh, Deuteronomy, again, is written to this generation of people uh, who it's written to here in Numbers. They're on the precipice of the promised land. So you go from Numbers, and you really should skip over to Joshua, where the action continues. Uh, Deuteronomy is more like a sermon or a series of sermons. Uh, there's also a more theological way of reading the book, and you can see it just in two big points. There is, there are, based on the two censuses, chapter 1, the first census, that first generation that came out of Egypt, and chapter 26, the second census. So there's an old generation and there's a new generation of Israelites. The old generation rebelled against God. And Moses is writing to that second generation saying, your parents rebelled against me. They did not mix their hearing the gospel, Hebrews 3 and 4, with faith. And so I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, the promised land. And so Moses preaches on that precipice of the promised land to a new generation who has great hope of entering in. 
The first generation of parents, they disbelieved. The second generation believes. The first were disobedient. The second was obedient. The first died and the second lives. So you see that there in that just two, two big points, chapter 1 to 25, chapter 26 to 36. Well, what's the theme? What's the big idea of numbers? Your sermon title there says, uh, In the Wilderness with God. Well, there are, again, there are two censuses, chapter 1, chapter 26. Moses was writing this book to that second generation. The first generation came out of Egypt, and they had children in those 40 years in the wilderness. That first generation died in the wilderness. They couldn't see the promised land. They couldn't enter in. Moses writes to that second generation, the children and even the grandchildren, who were born in the wilderness, who never saw the Red Sea split in two, who didn't see all the plagues, they experienced the man from heaven, but they did not see those great and glorious signs of redemption. And so Moses writes to them to say, your parents were disobedient. They did not enter my rest because they did not believe me. And there they were on the precipice, the plains of Moab, looking over into the promised land to cross into the, uh, past the Jordan River. And Moses says, be faithful, trust the Lord. Go in and take the land that I swore to give to your fathers and to Father Abram, Father Abraham especially. That's what it's about. It's Moses preaching a sermon, really, to point them to the bad news and point them forward to the good news. Your parents sinned and they fell. You on the precipice here are living in faith and in hope. Go in and take the land, you numbers of the Israelites. So it begins with a very bright start, we might say, in chapters 1 through 10. Uh, notice there's three, three things I want to say this morning, just following the, following the narrative. It begins with a bright start, chapters 1 through 10, roughly speaking. There's this census. And we read uh, in, in uh, uh, Exodus 40, if we go back in our Bibles to Exodus 40, that the tabernacle was erected in the second year, in the first month on the first day, after they came out of the promised land. One month later, Numbers 1, verse 1. It's the second year, second month, first day. So it's one month later, 30 days later, we read that Moses uh, gives the, or, uh, begins to count the names, the census. So the tabernacle is built. 30 days later, God gives directions, take a census of my people. Notice that in verse one, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse number 2. Why? Verse 3, he was to count all the males from 20 years old and upward who are able to go to war. This is not a census of everybody, but a census of fighting aged males, as we even hear in the media today, that terminology, that language. Recall the Lord's promise to Father Abraham way back when, to your offspring I will give this land. And that giving of the land, and that taking of the land, that possessing of the land, would incorporate the Israelites as the means of receiving it. They had to go in, they had to fight battles to receive this land. Remember, on the one hand, God says, I will give it, but now he's saying, take a census of fighting age males and go take it. God, in the Bible, to use theological terms, not only determines the end or the goal of all things, but also the means of getting to that goal. You know, it's one thing for us to say that we want to go uh, on a trip this winter. Maybe we want, to, we want to go skiing, or maybe we want to go see some family members who live far, far away. It's one thing to say that I'm going to be there, or that we're going to be there with them and, and celebrate Christmas, or we're going to do what we're going to do. But then you've got to get there. You've got to get there. There's got to be a way to get there. You've got to drive. You've got to take an airplane, maybe with possible multiple stopovers. So there's the end place that you want to get, but there's the means and the method and all the ways in which we actually get there. We see that here. God says, I'm going to give you the land, but yet you have to go in as an army and fight wars. In other words, the Bible, let me say unequivocally as uh, your pastor, as a pastor of a Reformed church, that we typically are, are uh, 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 falsely accused of believing in fatalism or determinism because we believe that God chooses and that God determines the end of all things. We're not determinists. We're not fatalists. We believe that God has determined the end of all things and the means and the ways and the methods to get all things to that end. Amen? And we see that here. 
The end was the promised land. The means was counting up all the names, adding them all up, dividing them up into armies, into platoons, and to going out into the, into the land and fighting the battle. Now, he, notice in chapter 1, verse 46, towards the end of that chapter, that Moses adds up all the numbers, and these are just the males who are 20 years old and above. There were 603,550. It's a big number, isn't it? I think Oceanside Vista Carlsbad is somewhere around 400 plus thousand. So roughly speaking, like this part of this Tri-City area and some, maybe add in San Marcos or, or, or Encinitas maybe. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And these are one of those passages, one of those supposed difficulties of the Bible that scripture skeptics like to point out. These numbers are just too huge to be taken, true, uh, to be taken seriously. Because if there are males... Uh, if this is just the male, these are just the males 20 years old and above, 603,000 and some change, that means that there must have been at least 2 million Israelites out in the wilderness. The numbers are too big, too vast, too impossible to believe. Now, among those who affirm the, the inspiration and the truthfulness or the infallibility of Scripture, there are at least five major views. I won't list them off, but there are five major views on how this can be taken seriously. Some take it just literally and say, yeah, despite the difficulties, we take these numbers literally. Some say that this is hyperbole. Uh, others say that the, the translations might be a little bit off and so forth. Uh, that the thousands might mean like sort of chiefs and it might mean something else. However we take these numbers though, remember what we saw back in Exodus chapter 1. There was a new king, a new pharaoh that did not know Joseph, and he was threatened because the Israelites began to be fruitful, to increase greatly, to be multiplied, to grow exceedingly strong, and the whole land of Egypt was filled with those Israelites. This is a way of showing us, again, what is God doing in the story? God is the one who was multiplying, who was increasing, who was blessing. He called Adam and Eve, and he called Noah and his sons with their wives to go out and be fruitful and multiply. But here we see it's God who is doing it. God is doing this. So however we take the numbers, the point is that God is doing something spectacular amongst his people. He's fulfilling his own promises, and he's sending them into the promised land to fight. Now, there are 12 tribes, right? But there's one tribe not listed in chapter 1 as being counted for the census. Which tribe was that? The Levites. So there are really 13 tribes, and there are 12 uh, that are not included. The Levites, why not? Why, why are they not included in the census of 20 males 20 years, above, uh, 20 years and above to go to war? Why were they not included? Well, remember that not all Levites are priests, right? There are the Levites, and then there are some who are priests. We'll come to that. But the whole tribe of Levi, there's something distinct about them. If you look in chapter 3, uh, I'll just mention verse 12 and 13, and then also verse 40 to the end. Uh, but in chapter 3, we learn this, that the Levites were taken by the Lord in the place of the firstborn. God had sent that plague upon the firstborn of all of Egypt, from uh, from the Pharaoh's son all the way down to the animals. And any Israelite who didn't put that blood upon their doorpost, their firstborn sons will be taken too. And so they did that. They sacrificed the Passover lambs. They, they spilled the blood. They, spread, they smeared the blood on their doorpost. The angel of the Lord passed by them, and they were safe. But then the Lord says this in chapter 3, that in the place of all the firstborn of the Israelites, who are mine, I own them. They are mine. In their place, I'm going to take the Levites. So instead of taking all the first one of all the tribes, the Lord takes the Levites and he calls them mine, we read. They are mine, this particular tribe. So while the rest of the tribes go out to war, we read in chapter 1, verse 53, I mentioned this last Sunday, that the Levites were to keep guard, that, ver that, that Hebrew verb shamar, to keep guard over the tabernacle just like Adam was to guard the garden in Genesis chapter number 2. Notice then chapter 2, the camp of the Israelites. 
the camp and uh, maybe kids, one of you can draw me a picture and give it to me. You probably can't do it this quick, but maybe you can give me a picture later. Draw me a picture of the camp. Draw me a picture of the camp. The tabernacle, if you remember, the tabernacle is sort of this rectangular structure. And it's, the entrance is on the east. So you would walk in on the east side and all the way to the west side of the tabernacle, it's not very big, that's the Holy of Holies. The theological reason is because you turn your back on the sun. The sun was a god for the Egyptians and for most of the societies around them. You turn your back, you, don't, you didn't pray to the sun, you turn your back on the sun and you worship the Lord. So you, the, the entrance was on the east, your back to the sun, you go to the west, that is where the Holy of Holies was. And, and in the middle of the camp was this tabernacle and, ca- and camped all around it on all four sides were various tribes. And we read about uh, on all four sides there are three tribes on each of the sides. But how about the Levites? What about them? Well, there are three families uh, of the Levites. There is the family of Gershon. Uh, there are the, there's the family of Kohath. And there is also the family of Merari. And they also encamped on various sides, the south, the west, and the north. But on the east side, only Moses, only Aaron and his sons, which at one point was four of them, but we saw last Sunday in Leviticus 10, two of them were taken up by God because of their false worship. So there are only four, Moses, Aaron, and his two sons, Eleazar and Ithamar. They camp right in front of of the entrance on the east side of the tabernacle to guard it. And to guard it, not just from outsiders, but to guard it from Israelites wanting to take a sneak peek into the Holy of Holies and be killed because they did that. And so each of these tribes encamped around the tabernacle and uh, each of the Levitical tribes encamped around the tabernacle and the the various three three camps of the, the Levites, the three families, uh, they each had a responsibility. Some had certain parts of the tabernacle, like the, the curtains and the pegs, and others had other parts of the tabernacle, and others had the Ark of the Covenant, and so forth. But again, what's in the very middle of the camp? All the tribes and all the Levites and Moses and Aaron and his sons, they're all encamped and circled around it. But what's in the middle? What's in the middle again of the camp? Nobody knows it's in the middle of the camp. I just said it. What's in the middle of the camp? The tabernacle, people. Are we awake this morning? It's okay. You can say the tabernacle. The Israelites encamped all around what? The tabernacle. All right, there you go. The tabernacle. And whose tent was the tabernacle? The Israelites lived in tents. Who lived in the tent of the tabernacle? The Israel, uh, the Lord, right? The Lord of the Israelites lived in the tent. The invisible God who made himself visible to Moses on the, uh, on the mountain of the burning bush. The invisible God who made himself visible in the burning of the pillar of cloud and fire. Who lived among his people. He lived in a tent too. God, the Lord, this glorious God, he stooped down to live with his people who were literally homeless in a tent with them. He stooped down to their condition. He understood their situation. He lived with them. And in the fullness of times, brothers and sisters, we as Christians, we read our Bibles, we read the whole Bible, we read in the Bible that in the fullness of times, this very same God, the God of the burning bush, the God of the pillar of cloud and fire, this God became flesh, and that he tabernacled, John 1, uh, 14 says, he tabernacled, he dwelt amongst us, human beings. This is all pointing us forward to something greater, of course. Our Lord and Savior, the Savior of the world. And by means of his death and resurrection, he has opened up the entrance, not into an earthly tabernacle or even a temple, but by his death, the curtain was torn in two, and by his resurrection, he then leads us by faith into the Holy of Holies to be able to enter God's presence Remember Hebrews 3 and 4. It's those who believe, who have rested from their works. And it's by the Spirit, as the Lord is resurrected and as He ascends, He sends down upon us His Holy Spirit, who grants to us the gift of faith, and we trust in Him, and we have access even right now into the very Holy of Holies, but also down here on earth, we might say, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within his 
ecclesia, his assembly. Whenever you read about the congregation uh, in the book of Numbers, that's the Hebrew term for, uh, Hebrew term kahal, uh, which is the assembly, the congregation, that's translated into Greek as ecclesia, which we translate as church. The Spirit of God takes up residence within his church, within his assembly, within his congregation. And so that the Apostle Paul can say that the church is the temple of God, and that the Apostle Paul can even say that you, individual Christian, are a temple of God, a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have access into the heavenly holy of holies. We are a temple as the church. We individually are temples of the Holy Spirit. And one day this great God is going to return. He's going to purify the world. He's going to remove all the sin, all the injustice, uh, all the frailty, all the fallenness, all the death, all the pain. He's going to remove it all and he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Where's the temple going to be on that new heavens and new earth? There is no temple, right? The whole thing is the temple. The Lord and the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ, will be that temple. Back to our story, though. We see in chapters 3 and 4, there are lots of uh, uh, words about the priests and the Levites. Because the Lord lived in that tent, in the center of the camp, he lived in the tabernacle, his presence was there, the glory of God was there, the story describes that. That, that, that by day, that pillar of cloud that led them to the wilderness, it rested upon the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, and at night it was like a pillar of fire. They saw gods. And because God was there, the tabernacle was holy ground. It was holy ground. And so Aaron, as the high priest, and his sons as priests, chapter 3, verse 10, again, were to guard. They were to guard the whole priesthood. And the Levites were given to Aaron and his sons to be servants of the priesthood. And the duties of the Levites were to guard Aaron. So they were to guard the, the, uh, the priesthood, but they were also to guard Aaron as the high priest especially. They were to guard the congregation from death itself because if they even touched the holy place, they would die. And only the Levites could pick up and carry and set up and touch and all the stuff all the furniture, all the apparatus to build that tabernacle. But even as a holy place, chapter 7 and 8 remind us of something. That the tabernacle itself, chapter 7, and the holy line of the Levites, chapter 8, God dwells in tabernacle. He takes the Levites. He calls them mine. Despite all of that, the tabernacle and the, and the Levites themselves had to be cleansed of sin and consecrated. What does that teach us? Despite all the holiness, despite all the blessing, everyone and everything was tainted and is tainted by the stain of sin. The priests, the sacrifices, the tabernacle itself could not remove the problem between God and the human race. What's that problem? It's not happiness? Isn't, it, isn't our problem happiness? We're just not happy enough. But isn't our real problem that the right, the right party isn't in office? That's what we're told like every two years when there's an election cycle. The wrong party's in office. Vote for me and you'll have your happiness. You'll have your lasting peace. These are all just sort of symptoms. Personal happiness, satisfaction, whatever the political drama of the day might be. A real problem is our sin. It separates us from our God. And it wasn't until that Savior to come came. He cleansed everything by his death, by his blood, so that we are actually able to enter into the heavenly holy of holies. We skip ahead to chapter 9 and 10. You see the march then of this holy army. They finally march out for the first time. The cloud that rested above the tabernacle 
the cloud finally lifted up and began to go, and they, and, they had to, and they had to take apart the tabernacle and follow the Lord in the wilderness, wherever he led. And to announce that, chapter 10 tells us, the Lord told Moses to, to create two silver trumpets, two silver trumpets for summoning, verse 2, chapter 10, for summoning the congregation and for breaking the camp. There's lots of, you see there, you blow it this way, for this thing, and you blow it that way for that thing and so forth. It was meant for a summoning of the people. And they followed the Lord, we are told. Notice this was year two, month two, day 20. So less than one month after the census was taken, the cloud lifted up, the trumpets were blown, the Lord began to move, and the people followed him. It's interesting, in chapter 10, verse 33, Uh, that we read this, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them to seek out a resting place for them. Ask yourself this, how does an inanimate object, the Ark, it's a wooden box overlaid with gold with poles on it, it can't move unless it's moved by people. How does an inanimate object be described as going up and seeking a resting place? How can a box do that? Could this table start moving and we would have to follow it? What is wood and gold? How does it seek things? How does it move? It doesn't. What is is being told to us there? Who's the one who's seeking? Who's the one who's moving? Who's the one who's marching? The Lord. The Lord. The ark was the sacramental sign of the Lord's very own presence. And so he was moving. He was leading. He was guiding. And when he went, they went. And when he stopped, they stopped. Now note one more thing in chapter 10. This is really awesome, I think. As Israel went out from Mount Sinai into the wilderness of Paran, verse 12 tells us, notice what Moses does. Moses freely offers the good news of the gospel to a non-Israelite by the name of Hobab the Midianite. This was, in fact, his brother-in-law. And he says there, notice in verse 29, Come with us, and we will do good to you. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. You see, already there in the ancient wilderness, the Lord's good news of redemption for Israel was already then and there being extended out to what the New Testament describes as the Gentiles, the world. How does Hobab respond in verse 30? He resists. He rejects the offer. He wants to stay with his people. Right? This is the typical response of unbelief. But Moses persisted. And he even says, Hobab, you have gifts and skills that our congregation needs as we travel throughout the wilderness. And he reiterates in verse 32, if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we will do to you. And then immediately in verse 33 we read, they set out. Now, I take that in verse 33. They set out. I take that to mean that this Hobab went up with them too. Because later on, Judges 1, verse 16, in the middle of this, of this story, just sort of nestled in there amongst some verses, we read that this very family of the Kenites, which, of which Hobab is a part, we're already in the promised land with the tribe of Judah. You see, he preached the gospel. He, he announced the good news to this outsider, to this Gentile, to this one that was not a part of the Israelite nation, who was not redeemed out of Egypt, but he invited him to, and he went, and his family, a generation later, is there in the promised land. Invite with the gospel, loved ones, any and all who would listen to you, any and all, and let the Lord work. Only the Lord knows. Moses does that already in the Old Testament. Now we see here how it all starts out sort of 
with some good news. It all seems great. There's some bright start here, but then the sun begins to set on this first generation. And I'll just mention a couple of, a couple of examples. Chapter 11. They go out and they complain. There's no meat. Just some manna. There's no meat, just manna. And Moses, as he cries out to God, notice even in chapter 11, verse 15, he's saying that the burden of this people is so great. Why have you brought me up to deal with this people? Kill me at once, Moses says. And the Lord gave them what they wanted. You want meat? Fine, you'll get meat. And he sent so many quails that they ate more meat than they could handle, and the Lord sent a plague upon them and began to kill those who grumbled against him. Notice in chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Notice that in verse 1. They spoke against Moses. Why? These are the Israelites. Who did Moses marry? He married a Cushite woman. What does that mean? Where, where was ancient Cush? This was like the ancient, the ancient kingdom of Nubia in those days, but today would be uh, like, like Sudan, North Sudan, uh, Ethiopia. He married a non-Jew, notice. He married a Cushite woman. But also notice their real complaint was this. That's always the outward thing. People always have problems with race and ethnicity because that, that's always just like, the, there's really something else going on, isn't there? The real issue is this. Has the Lord and Jesus spoken only through Moses? They were jealous. They were jealous. The Lord was revealing himself to Moses and God says, you know, when I speak to prophets, I show dreams and visions and they speak my word, but not to Moses. He speaks to me mouth to mouth. He sees me. Exodus told us that he met with God in his own little personal tent and they spoke face to face as one would speak with a friend. And so they were jealous of Moses. And what does God do? He curses Miriam with leprosy, the skin disease. And Aaron begs Moses, who then begs God. And then God says she has to be put out of the camp for seven days and then I will heal her. So all the Israelites are grumbling. They're all complaining. Even the leaders even those closest to Moses, his very own family, they are grumbling against him. So he sends the spies out, chapter 13. One spy from each of the 12 tribes, one head chief of each of the 12 tribes. We know the two most important ones are Caleb and Joshua. And they go and they are told to spy out the land, look what the land's like, tell us what the people are like, what are their cities like, and bring back a, a token of what that land is like. And we see there... Uh, that they bring back in chapter uh, 13, verse 23, it took two men to carry a large pole with just one vine of, uh, of a grapevine from that land. It was so plentiful, so heavy, so blessed that it took two men to carry one vine. But yet, 10 of the 12 gave this bad report. The people are strong. Verse 28. The cities that are fortified are very large. Besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the Nephilim. We saw them way back when in Genesis chapter 6. These giants live there. And we seem to be like grasshoppers. But only Caleb's report, at least as it's reported here, we know Joshua too, but Caleb is reported as saying something different. By faith, he says in verse 30, let us go up at once and occupy the land, for we are well able to overcome it. That's why he and Joshua get to go, and the rest don't. And so God says they can't go in. All the congregation, though, in chapter 14, uh, they all raise a loud cry. They grumble again against Moses and Aaron. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or, that, or would, we, would that we had died in this wilderness. Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. How do you think Moses and Aaron responded to that? They fell on their faces, verse 5. What did Joshua and Caleb, the good spies, do? They tore their clothes, right? This is, they're in utter shock, an utter lament. 
God, do not judge us. Do not listen to them. And then Joshua and Caleb say that everything is going to be all right because we have one thing going for us. Look at verse 9. What is, what is what do Joshua and Caleb say? They say a lot of things here, but there's one thing that is said that's most important. What's the most important thing that the Israelites needed to hear? Their cities are fortified. They're, they are giants in the land. There's no way we can defeat them. Joshua and Caleb say what? The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. And if God be for us, you know the verse, right? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? But God says, I've had enough. The story recounted here in chapter 14 correlates to Exodus 32, where the Lord threatens to wipe out all of Israel and to start over just with Moses. But Moses pleads with God. He intercedes. He prays to God. God, no. You are the Lord, the God who forgives iniquity. You are the God of grace. You see that there where he, he recounts the Lord's name, verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Please pardon, verse 19, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love. And the Lord says, I have pardoned them, verse 20. I have pardoned them, verse 20. But notice there's always a consequence for sin. And the consequence was that while they, those spies were in the land for 40 days, spying out the land, for every day they were there, not believing me, they're going to have one year of wilderness wandering. And they're going to wander around until that one generation that did not believe me, until they all fall in the desert and die. I forgive this sin, but they are all going to die. God is holy. God is just. It should have taken just a couple of weeks to travel from the, mount, from the, mount, uh, the, the, the desert of Sinai to the promised land, but it takes them 40 years. So they can't go in because of the 10 men, the 10 spies who give a bad report, they're giants, their cities are huge, there's no way we can take them. And that generation, that first generation that came out, they don't believe. They follow that bad report. They don't listen to Joshua and Caleb's preaching. They listen to the bad report, the bad preaching of the ten. And so they cannot enter into my rest. What about Moses? What about Moses? I mean, surely he's a believer. Surely Moses gets to go in, but skip ahead to chapter 20. We read a story again that they're grumbling, they're complaining. There's no water here to drink. There's no food for us to eat. They grumble again and again and again against Aaron and Moses. And the Lord tells Moses, take that staff in your hand and tell that rock to yield water. Now in Exodus 17, we saw, the Lord told Moses that I'm going to stand on the rock. The Lord did. Strike the rock and water will come out. What was the Lord saying there? The Lord was taking upon, the Israelite, uh, taking upon himself the punishment the Israelites deserved. They deserved to die. The Lord said, I'm going to stand between, between them, and I'm going to be on the rock, strike the rock, symbolic of taking upon them the punishment. In Numbers 20, though, what do we read? Moses struck the rock how many times? Two times. Two times. Why? It seems like he did so in anger. He did so in anger, but he did so distrusting the Lord. Notice, because you do not believe me, the Lord says, verse 12, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land. The story reminds us that God's people didn't enter their rest way back when, the call goes to us to still turn. To turn from that first generation's unbelief. To turn in faith and to trust the Lord, whatever He says. 
they didn't enter the land and its rest, but there still remains for us, Hebrews tells us, there still remains for us a rest, a Sabbath rest. And those who believe have ceased working and they enter the rest that God has. One more example, quickly here, chapter 21, verses 4 and following. Again, the people became impatient. Again, they spoke against God. Again, they spoke against Moses, verses 4 and 5. They were going out into the wilderness, and <clears throat> again, they complained, they grumbled. There was no water to drink. There was no food. All there was was this manna. And the Lord, in this time, uh, in this occasion, the Lord sent fiery serpents, meaning they bit them. These are poisonous snakes. They were bit, and it felt like their bodies were on fire, and many died, verse 6. Now, some acknowledged their sin, in this case at least, and begged Moses, again begged Moses, to intercede with the Lord, which Moses did. What did the Lord tell Moses to do? this time. Make a fiery serpent. We assume it's out of metal. And set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound familiar? It's a really strange story, isn't it? The very curse becomes the Lord's means to bless. These snakes bite. Their bodies fill the venom and they die. And some are about to die and they're crying out, help us! Moses prays. The Lord says, make this fiery serpent put on a pole in some form or another. And the very thing that cursed them now becomes a thing that blesses. All those who look and see the serpent will live. So all the way back in the garden, God threatened the day that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on that day you shall surely die. Death is the ultimate curse of the human race. But it's through death that we find life, isn't it? It's through the curse that the blessing of God comes to us. And we read these words, our Lord Jesus Christ, who no doubt knew his Old Testament better than anyone else who ever lived, said this in John 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Listen to this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So what is Jesus saying that he's like in the story? Is he Moses or is he the serpent? He's the curse, isn't he? What's the purpose of that? That whoever believes, verse 15, whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, the one who's lifted up like a serpent, the curse, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Whatever it is that has bitten us, as it were, and we feel that fiery sting, we know that we're going to die as human beings. It's appointed for man to live once and to die once, and then comes the judgment. We're all going to die. That's the bad news. The good news is that one has died already for you. And if you just trust in him, as it were, look at him, you will live forever. Just as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, and all those who looked at it live, so must the Son of Man be lifted up upon the cross and die so that all who look to him won't die, spiritually that is, but will live forever. The book ends with some glimmers of hope. So it begins in a bright way. It, then we see the, the sun setting, so to speak. Then it has some glimmers of hope. And I mentioned a couple of them there on the outline. You have the daughters of, uh, <clears throat> the daughters of Zelophehad, uh, Their father had no sons, and so as they were going to go into the promised land, they tell Moses, if we, uh, uh, because he had no sons, there's no inheritance for our father's name, and if we go in as the daughters and our father's name uh, no longer, uh, if there are no sons to have the inheritance, his name's going to cease to exist. Because the, the, the culture was that fathers passed on their inheritance to their sons, not to their daughters, but our dad had no sons. His name's going to cease. His line is going to end. But we are his offspring. We are his daughters. And Moses inquires of the Lord, and the Lord says, the, if a man dies with no sons, the inheritance goes to the daughters. 
They believed, you see. The point is that they believed. They believed the Lord. They trusted in His promise and provision of the promised land. And the Lord commended them by saying that they would receive the inheritance. So that their faith was already out of the wilderness into the promised land. But God had said He was going to give to Father Abraham. And then we see Moses' successor, Joshua. Again, only he and Caleb desired to enter the land when the other ten said no. And so Moses prays. He asks the Lord, do not let your people be like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord appoints Joshua. The Lord gives him the Holy Spirit. Moses lays his hands upon him in in the eyes of all the congregation. And he's commended, he's consecrated, he's set apart as the leader. The one who leads into the promised lands. We'll see that in Joshua. And the land itself, chapter 34. The land itself was there and is sort of ripe for the picking, as it were. And Moses again exhorts the second generation, they're on the precipice of the promised land, to know the boundaries, to know where every tribe is going to fit, and to go in and possess the land as God has said. They've been preparing, they've been hearing the stories of their parents' disobedience, and they've been built up in faith to trust the Lord. And they would follow their leader, Joshua. And so Numbers describes Israel, they're preparing at the foot of Mount Sinai. They're failing all throughout the wilderness. But we read in this book also that they begin to prepare again. This second generation that trusts the Lord, that clings to His promises. The stories of the two generations provided in the book of Numbers uh, provided in the book of Numbers reveal a powerful testimony of God's patience and grace through both the rebellious and the obedient generations of his people. He disciplines the stubborn, he curses those who disbelieve, but he does not abandon his covenant promise, you see. He doesn't abandon his covenant promise. Now, did that second generation, was every single one of them an, an, an absolute, like on fire, 100% believer? We're going to see no. But God was faithful. But God was good. But God pardoned. But God forgave. But God used them. But God blessed them. And through them, God would bring to the world a Savior that we know as our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he exhorts that generation, be faithful, be bold, go in, trust. And we have all the promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is the yes and the amen of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our great and our gracious God, we ask now that you would uh, receive us as we come to your table to receive from you this uh, tangible and earthly little token uh, of your eternal blessings, just like that one clump of and cluster of grapes was a sign and token of the blessing of the Lord in that promised land. So too you've given us this bread and wine as a a small little token, a little bit, a little taste of uh, of the uncountable blessings and graces of our Savior Jesus Christ that are already ours by faith and that one day will be ours by sight. And so we long to see that. We long to see you. We long to enter into that promised land that eternal place where there is no more death or pain or crying or suffering, all things are made new. We long for that day. And so we ask as we come to hear your word and as we receive the Lord's Supper, that you would lift our hearts and our souls to you to receive all the blessings that you have for us and to receive them all by faith. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen.